Well, listen, thank you for coming. Today's always good for me. This day, God is bringing it here. Uh, if this lesson is half as good as the last one he had, room for tree. It's really, really good for him to be here. I don't know of anything that I need to announce or tell you except wish you a Merry Christmas. I'm glad you're here. Hope you have a good holiday. It'll be 13 tomorrow next Saturday. I'll be on the beach. <laughs> good luck to you. Uh, well, that's uh, hey, what you remember? Sure. Pause for a minute. Father in heaven, Lord, we just thank you for your graciousness and your goodness today. I just invite your Holy Spirit to be with us as we look at this lesson today. Open our minds and open our hearts to what is being spoken today in Jesus' name. Yeah. Amen. Oh, come Beautiful. And those of you online, I know that you had the Mormon Tabernacle singing Christmas carols okay. just before we came on. So we don't want to show them up, but we're almost as good. Yeah. Yeah. Buckle, buckle, beanstalk. Do those words mean anything to any of you? Buckle, buckle, beanstalk. To the rain. Maybe to my sister Marie, I do not have my Swiss Army knife in my pocket because the airlines won't allow me to do that. Yeah. <laughs> but if I did, I would pull it out. All of you know what color red a uh, red Swiss Army knife is. <laughs> you come out of color, they have blue and so on. Mine is red. It was a game that we played with our kids when they were growing up. In fact, my daughter was disillusioned when several years ago she said the words huckle, buckle, beanstalk. And a friend of her said, Oh, my dad played that with us too. And she said, No, that's our game. My dad made that up. I played it. She came to me, you know, almost like a kid. Who is wondering if Santa Claus is real? That was that moment. 
And she said, Dad, did you invent Huckle Buckle Beanstalk? I said, no, I found it in a game book. She said, oh, all these years I thought you invented Huckle Buckle Beanstalk. <laughs> but here's the essence of Huckle Buckle Beanstalk. You take an item. Now, my take on this was that it was a red Swiss army knife. I think the book required a thimble or something like that. And you hide it in plain sight. You hide it in plain sight. It cannot be under anything. All of the item has to be completely in sight. So with a red Swiss army knife, you look for something red. So like you find a red book in the bookshelf and you lean it up against that book or you find some decoration in the house or a red tablecloth and you just lay it right on the tablecloth. The game is, everybody has their eyes shut. You can't trust the kids at that age to keep their eyes shut. They have to leave the room. <laughs> <laughs> they all come back in and they start looking for this thing that is hidden in plain sight. <clears throat> and the first one to see it shouts, Huckle Buckle Beanstalk. <laughs> but if you get really good at the game, you don't shout Huckle Buckle Beanstalk until you walk away from it, yes. right? Because <laughs> then everybody knows where it is and they can find it. <laughs> well, of course, if you're playing with three-year-olds, their self-control <laughs> is not there. They're using a the buckle bean song! <laughs> <laughs> and then everybody finds it. Anyway, I am looking forward to playing this with our grandkids. The tradition will go on to another generation. <laughs> the reason I tell you about this game, is this idea of hiding in plain sight. <laughs> Have you ever experienced something hiding in, I remember one time we were playing Huck and Buckle Reading Soccer, it was so funny, we were playing with all the cousins. And I think it was David, my brother's middle, middle son. And he was looking at the bookshelf, and as I remember, there was a red truck on the bookshelf, and this thing was sitting in the bed of that little toy bed. <laughs> And he was looking at the bookshelf. He said, where is it? I know it's somewhere here. That's where everybody's been coming. So where is it? And he's looking right at it. Can't see it. Have you ever experienced losing your keys or your wallet or your phone? And it's in plain sight. Anybody ever experienced losing something in plain sight? <laughs> It happened to Judy all the time. Everyone got a quick, quick incident that might be interesting for the rest of us to hear? Please. I was looking for my keys and I got out to the car and couldn't get in the car and said, oh, I've got to walk back to the house. And the keys were in my hand. <laughs> you do that with glasses too, right? I saw a cartoon one time with eight or ten people sitting in a circle. All of them had the glasses on their on their quarter flight. Like you do, Doug. And Simon Gore says, support group for people who often lose their glasses. <laughs> anyway, that's a quick story of losing something in plain sight. My dad what always is? lost his hat and he was wearing it. Lost his hat and he was wearing it. One more. I lost my phone when I was on a phone call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is a Christmas lesson. We're not using the harmony today, nor will we use it next week. I'll be teaching, but remotely next week. We have a two-part series today. Today is the build-up to the birth. We're going to be talking about the birth of Jesus next week, which is Christmas Eve. Today, we're going to lose into the build-up that is all of the clues, mostly in the Old Testament, that should have made Jesus' birth obvious. Oh, yeah. We knew this was going to happen. We knew where it was going to happen. We knew when it was going to happen. We knew what it was going to mean. And yet Jesus' coming, and really not just his birth, but his whole life, 
and death and resurrection was hidden in plain sight. There were some people looking right there and saying, where is it? Now you say, well, that's interesting. But is it really worth spending a couple of weeks on? Let me tell you why we didn't spend a couple of weeks on this. By the way, I just want to acknowledge those of you online. We don't see any of your faces, but we're glad you're here. Good to see you. Um, I think it's very possible. Let's just take Christmas time right now for example. Jesus, it's probably about as evident in popular culture at Christmas time as anything. There's manger scenes, there's Christmas carols that do talk about Jesus. There are special musical programs on TV. And while there's, I know, quite a mixture of Frosty the Snowman and Santa Claus is coming to town, I know those get their airtime too, but there's still a lot about Jesus. Christmas time, Jesus can be hidden in plain sight. Right there. Obvious to everybody, and yet not really making any impact on anybody. Just one. But maybe there's something even more significant than that. How about those of us that show up here at this class week after week? That go to church, listen to sermons, maybe listen to Christian radio, we are members of Bible studies. Is it possible that we get so comfortable with all of this casual contact with Jesus that Jesus for us is hidden in plain sight? Right there, but not really there. And it's that that we're going for today and next week. And saying, what is there in the Christmas story that might be a cautionary tale for us about not allowing Jesus to be hidden in plain sight. So that instead of just being present, he is really there. And more and more, that's what I'm wanting in my own life. I am wanting for Jesus to be deeply present in my life. I'm wanting to be connected to him. And I'm wanting that to be a part of every conversation, everything that I'm involved with, that my connection with Jesus is real, constant, meaningful. I want that for you, too. And so that's why we're looking at this today. That's, that's really what we're doing. Now, let's, let's come back to the, the idea of sure. Jesus being hidden in plain sight. And what were the clues that were dropped along the way? We're going to start at the very beginning of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, and then move our way through a number of prophecies fairly quickly and begin seeing the evidence that was pieced together for how Jesus could have been known and recognized. And we're going to save enough time at the end of class to say, so what have we learned from this? How does this apply to us today? And I'd like you to open your Bibles. I suggested that it would be well for you to bring Bibles that had Old and New Testament in them, because we're going to be mostly in the Old Testament today. But if you'd open your Bibles to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 3. And of course, for those of you who are familiar with the stories of Genesis 1, 2, and 3, this is the story of Adam and Eve turning their backs on God and God coming and finding them and in that process of talking with them after he's found them he speaks to Adam, he speaks to Eve and he speaks, speaks to the snake and there's some symbolic language here and we could take the entire lesson just unpacking even this one passage and since we're looking at a handful we're going to look at it very quickly but we won't unpack everything but I'm going to assume that some of this is fairly familiar to most of you. And for those of you that it's not familiar to, let's find out how we can catch up some other time. Genesis 3 and verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, and the this is 
seducing Adam and Eve to turn away from God. Because you have done this, cursed are you of all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. Now, some scholars who do not believe that predictive prophecy is possible, in other words, that, um, that there's that much supernatural in the Bible and the miracles and the prophecies they tend to discount. Some scholars look at this and say, this is just an interesting comment about the way that humans and reptiles like snakes would interact. And it's just explaining that there is a reason for reptiles like snakes being <laughs> disgusting to many people. Maybe, but I think there's something more here. And the next phrase does seem to push that a little bit farther. In verse 15, God's still speaking to the snake, who is a stand-in for the enemy. The book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, the devil is called that snake, that ancient serpent, Called God speaking to the snake in verse 15 says, and I will put enmity, hatred, contention, between you, the snake, Satan, and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. Lots packed in that phrase. But here's the last phrase I really want you to catch. He will crush your head. Just pause there for a minute. He will crush your head. Does that sound fatal? <laughs> yeah. I mean, this sounds pretty fatal, pretty final. And just catch the significance, if in fact this is God speaking to the, to the enemy. On the very day that humanity turns their back on God, God steps into that moment and says, I just want you to know, this is not the end of the story. I want you to know today, when you feel like you have just messed everything up, and broken the connection that has meant life to you, that I am going to ultimately crush this one who has seduced you away from me. This evil and the one perpetrating evil will one day be crushed. That's a pretty hopeful statement for God to, on that day, Adam and Eve say, I just want you to know that one day evil is going to be completely crushed. That's a powerful statement in this story. Now, the next statement is sobering. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you, Satan, you will strike his heel. Again, I wish we could amplify this a bit. Let's just leave it at this. This is going to come at a cost. This will really be costly. And we don't have all the details played out here, but what we see is that in the process of crushing evil, it's going to cost God something. And so we already have the very beginnings of a picture of a Messiah coming. The Messiah will come. And he will do away with evil, but it's going to cost him something. How much is it going to cost him? We learn that on the cross. We see how much it cost him. But right now, we're just getting these little tiny clues of what's going to open up later. And we begin pulling these clues together, and we see that these clues were all available to the people in Jesus' day. But like a jigsaw puzzle that isn't put together well, they put it together and it didn't make any sense. They did not have the picture. Now, let's look quickly at a couple of others. And I'd like you to turn to the book of, stay in the book of Genesis, turn to chapter 12. Look at chapter 12. We come down to the time of history when God focuses his energy on one individual, Abraham, and Abraham's family. And the good that he wants to do for humanity is going to be funneled through Abraham's family. 
And he says it this way in verses 1, 2, and 3 to Genesis 12. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth. Again, that's the side of that. All people on earth will be blessed through you. And of course, Paul picks this up. We won't turn that in Galatians 3. Paul picks up and he says, how did this happen? Through Jesus, of course. It's Paul's answer there, Galatians 3. That it is in the family of Abraham that Jesus comes but not only that Jesus is just born genealogically in that family, it's that this family for hundreds of years, for centuries, was preparing the world for the coming of Jesus. They had all this special information, all these clues, helping them to be ready and helping others to recognize Jesus when he came. Now, if you were the devil, where would you target much, most of your deceptive energies if you were trying to confuse people about the coming of the Messiah? Abraham's family, right? That's where you would target, because that's where the most information was, which is, in fact, what happened. And if you look at the story that happens between Abraham and the time of Jesus, what you have is a nation who have been given a task and they keep getting off task. They keep moving off task and they move off task so badly that pretty soon they are living and, and thinking and being worse than the people that God had sent them to help. <laughs> and it gets so bad that at some point God says, I, I need to radically shake things up. And so one of the ways that he tried to shake things up was through their own leadership. And we have Saul first. Saul doesn't do so well. First king. And then the next king, they have David. David seems to start off a little better, but then he doesn't do so well. But for whatever reason, God uses David and his house, his <coughs> extended family and his lineage to become the funnel within the funnel because Jesus is going to be born from David's family now. David is an offspring of Abraham and this is funneling down to the point where God says, I am going to make David's throne and David's offspring the very one who will do all these things that I promised to do in the process of crushing the snake. Are you with me so far? So he, he narrows it down. And, and I want you to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7. We're skipping way forward, I know. 2 Samuel chapter 7. And at one point in David's life, he says, you know, God, you've been so good to me. I would like to build a house for you. And those of you that were with us for two years, whatever it was, when we studied the life of David, remember the interesting little twist on things. God says, thanks, but no thanks. So let me build a house for you. God speaking to David. You don't build a house for me, I'll build a house for you. But the little twist on it is this. He says, the house I'm going to build for you will be a house of your throne and the people on your throne going on forever. And ultimately, that throne is going to be held by the most ultimate king doing all these good things that I promised for so long. And I want you to just see, this is the first time that promise comes to David. And David has not heard this before. This is coming as news to him. And we're in chapter 7 and verse, um, verse 11. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, 
who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with the rod of men, with floggings inflicted by men. You say, wait a minute, is this talking about the Messiah? I didn't think he did anything wrong. Well, there's an immediate application that applies to whom? So, Solomon. Yeah. Did Solomon do anything wrong? Yeah. A thousand times. Yeah. yeah. Um, at least a thousand times. And so this applies, first of all, to Solomon. But then notice what is next could not apply to Solomon. But my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, who I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure how long? Forever. For me, your throne will be established forever. Now, we're not turning there, but just jumping ahead. When Gabriel is speaking to Mary and saying, you're going to have a son, Mary says, how could this be? You know that story. Then, what does the angel say to her about the royal nature of her son? Remember, he will sit on the throne of his father, David, and he will reign forever. The angel quotes from this very passage and applies it to Jesus. So we have good solid ground to know that this is looking way beyond Solomon. Now what happens is that over the next few generations, David becomes the stand-in and David's name becomes a stand-in for this Messiah who is going to come and attack the snake. We look at a few of those passages, and we're going to see the clues that God began dropping about what was going to happen. Uh, let's turn forward to the book of Isaiah. Go to Isaiah and chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. And I'm sorry, I'm not doing a lot of interaction right now. I'm, I'm watching the time, and all of this will be fun to interact on. And if it looks like we're going to be able to finish on time, I'm going to invite more interaction, okay? So Isaiah chapter 9, and verses 6 and 7. For to us, how many of you, by the way, have ever sung the Handel's Messiah? <clears throat> you cannot read this passage without hearing Handel's Messiah in your head. And the Japanese emphasizing every word. For unto us a child is born. We could get a chorus going here in a bit. But we probably would not do as well as the Mormon Tabernacle on that way. It's a little bit more complex than O Come All You Faithful. My goodness. For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God. Just pause here for a second. What clue are we beginning to get here that's way beyond the clues that we've seen so far? I, I am asking your interaction here. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a rhetorical question. <laughs> what, what are some of the clues that are already beginning to pop up here? You say, whoa, new information here. Pardon me? More than human. More than human. Yeah, I like that. Anything else? His title. His title. Yeah. Let's keep reading. There's several titles here. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Could this have applied to Solomon? No. And it, it is past the time of Solomon, by the way. But it could not apply to any of the descendants of David. We're talking about someone who's more than human. What we're beginning to see is God saying, I want you to know that this solution is so far beyond any human, I myself will step into history and make this happen. Now, I had a Jewish friend one time who was very open to talk about the differences and the similarities between Christianity and Judaism. And he said to me, we were eating lunch one day, he said, you know, the scandal of Christianity is that God would show up as a human. He said, for us, as, as Jewish believers, that is just scandalous. God is so far beyond us that how could he possibly step in and be human? And I said, I agree with you, it is scandalous. 
And that's one of the comforts of <laughs> God was willing to go through that scandal. And worse, to be stripped naked and nailed to the most cruel sort of execution it was that God would do that. I mean, we've lost the shock of that. It's a shocking thing. We just take this a little bit farther. I used to say in my classes when I was teaching on the life of Jesus here at Southern. You know, Jesus had been born <clears throat> in the wild, wild west. Instead of crosses on our steeples, we would probably have gallows. Oh, that would be gross. A gallow on the steeple. Well, the cross hit people with that same gross thing. That was a gross thing. Everybody had seen executions. And that's why Paul said that the cross was foolishness to the Jews and a stumbling block to the Greeks. We think of crosses as beautiful decorations now. Crosses were like an electric chair hanging around your neck or a gallows hanging around your neck. They were ugly forms of execution. In this conversation over lunch, I said, you know, it's interesting. Even in the scriptures, which he was the only with, I said, God did show up in some interesting ways sometimes. I said, yeah. He said, well, he, he showed up in a burning bush to Moses. I said, yeah. And I said, he showed up looking like a person to Abraham when Abraham invited these three strangers into his tent. I said, yeah. And I checked through a couple of others. He said, huh, never thought of that. I said, so even it seems like in scripture, God didn't mind showing up looking like something else so that he could connect with people. Maybe he was willing to do that when he showed up ultimately to connect with people. Well, I gotta think about it. So in Isaiah 8, 9, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government, and peace. There will be no end. He will reign where? David. On David's throne, and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness, from that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So her 700 years, we're, we're looking about 600 years before Jesus was born, these clues are being dropped that are connecting the dots along the way. And connecting the dot to Abraham, to Abraham, to David, but now adding new pieces and saying there's more to this, more to this story. Let me show you a few more. And if you looked at the email and the list of text, there were a bunch of them. I know we're not looking at all of them, but we're looking at a few of them. And even the ones in the email didn't include them all. There's many, many more ones. Wanting to come to some of the more potent ones. Stay in the book of Isaiah and go forward to chapter 11, just a page over. Chapter 11, verse 1 to 5. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. Lots of metaphors here. How many of you have ever cut down a tree and then seen the shoots that come up? That's the metaphor they use. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of power. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. Now, this doesn't say anything about the throne of David, but it's clear in the context as you read all of these. This is all talking about the same person. And I just want to be a little bit kind right now to the people who misunderstood things. Because granted, God didn't necessarily give all of the clues exactly the way that we would like the clues to be given. And I think it's 
probably for the same reason that Jesus didn't always explain all these parables. I don't want you to think. I want you to give some thought to this. I want you to do some piecing together. Because in this same prophecy, which we just read, it talks about getting rid of wicked. Okay, that's you know, crushing the snake. It talks about justice and peace. It talks about bringing righteousness. It talks about caring. This one doesn't, but a parallel one. Caring for the blind, for the lame. And you've been putting all these pictures together. You say, okay, wait a minute. This is a warrior ruler who's going to kill the enemies and bring sight to the blind. And it could be a little bit confused. And you say, okay, how is this person going to act? And what tended to happen, and this is no different than us, people tended to remember the things that were easiest to apply in their immediate situation. And so in their immediate situation, if the Romans were bothering them, which they were in the first century, they could say, oh yeah, we got a guy coming who's going to take care of the dirty old Romans. And you remember that part of the prophecy. Or if you were poor and downtrodden, maybe blind or lame, you might remember that part of the prophecy. It says, oh, there's a time coming when this Messiah, this promised one, this son of David, is going to make my body good. So you probably tend to remember those things that were most interesting, most helpful for you to be applied. And by the time of Jesus, most of them were so focused on getting rid of those pesky Romans. And so their almost entire focus was on a Messiah who would be a military leader getting rid of the, of the Romans. Did Jesus fit any of that? Just and, and so to be kind to them, we say, okay, that's why they didn't maybe get it. And Jesus was hiding in plain sight. Look at the very next verse, which we did not read here in Isaiah 11. It says in verse 6, the wolf will lie, the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them, etc. Huh. When do we usually talk about that happening? We talk about that happening in the future with the second coming of Jesus. Is that a result of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection? Yeah. Did it happen within a few weeks after his life, death, and resurrection? No. Life, death, and resurrection? <laughs> no. And so we see that something else that these prophecies do is they take the scope of what Jesus did with everything and say, here is the result. Kind of like going back to Genesis 3 and saying, one day, the snake's head is going to get crushed. You might remember that when Cain was born, he said, oh, good. Here's the one. This little baby of mine is going to grow up and crush his stuff and said, did it happen? Little did she know it was going to be you know, millennia before that would happen. And so what, what God says, here's ultimately what I'm going to do. He doesn't necessarily give us all the timelines. He says, this is where we're heading. This is our goal. Here's where we're going. But it may be separated by some time. And has the lion and the lamb laid down together yet? And so that's still coming, but it's still a part of what Jesus ministry. Is this making sense? And so if we're going to cut the slack, put a little bit of slack to the people of Jesus' day, you say, well, maybe if I didn't, I wouldn't have been so sure of myself either. I would have said, okay, how do you sort these things out? How do you make sense of it? Now, the clues are there, and when Jesus showed up, there was another reason, and we'll look at that in a moment, why they didn't look at the clues and make sense of them. But let's look at a few more clues first. Stay in the book of Isaiah for just a little bit longer, and go to Isaiah chapter 16. Isaiah chapter 16, verse 5. <clears throat> Isaiah 16, verse 5. In love, a throne will be established. In faithfulness, a man will sit on it. One from the house of David, one who in judging seeks justice and speeds the cause of 
righteousness. Now, again, this is tying together familiar clues, but it's, it's adding another little piece. It's going to be a man, but God has also said he's going to be the everlasting father. And this is a mystery we can't even put together, let alone people trying to grapple with this before it happened. And he is going to be the cause of righteousness. Clear warning that one of his highest priorities is not necessarily military, but it's moral, it's social, it's relational. And this seems to be a piece that they had often overlooked. And that they missed that Jesus was coming to heal the brokenhearted, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the sons and the hearts of the sons to the father, etc. And to do relational work. It was there, but the military stuff really just that, that kind of scratched the niche they had at the time. They missed some of this stuff. A couple of other clues. Let's look at a few others. In the book of Isaiah, uh, to Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. By the time of Jeremiah, Next book over, Jeremiah chapter 23. The house of David was largely with a memory from the distant past. The people had now been carried away to captivity in Babylon, where God was trying to get their attention again and trying to help them understand that they had something to do for the entire world and that their time in captivity would give them even opportunity to do that to reach out to their captors and to share something about who god was with their captors and jeremiah is writing just before this and just at the beginning of this captivity that's his context and he points forward to what the messiah this ultimate snake crusher, this son of David, would do. And here in Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 5, he says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch. Sounds like what we read in Isaiah. I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteousness. And it pulls together some of the national and political on the one hand, with the moral and the relational on the other. He's going to do both. This is who the king, the son of David, is going to be. So they're getting these clues. What they're making of them are the test. We don't have all of the records of how people were receiving this as they were coming. We are still a good 500 years, 400, 500 years before the time of Jesus. But we do know that by the time that Jesus came, they were not putting these pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together very well. They were not connecting the dots very well. Let's look at a couple more and then let's come to the New Testament. Here in the book of Jeremiah, just over a few pages, chapter 30. Jeremiah chapter 30. And verse 9. Go back up to verse 8. In that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will break the yoke off their necks and will tear off their bonds. No longer will foreigners enslave them. And you say, whoa, that sounds good. If you're in captivity, promise that God is going to deliver you. Instead, they will serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. So there was reason to expect some sort of political activity, some sort of being released from the, the bondage. And again, in Jesus' day, people didn't necessarily realize that their bondage to evil and to the evil one was more damaging than their bondage to the Romans. That was not an idea that they were entertaining. Ezekiel. Let's go to a couple of the Ezekiel. Here's where you're going to see some more familiar. Let's keep going for it. Ezekiel is living after the time of the captivity. And Ezekiel chapter 34, we've read this before when we studied the idea of, of Jesus as shepherd. 
And when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, he's largely, not totally, but largely drawing from Ezekiel 34. And Ezekiel 34 is talking about the lousy shepherds that they have. And if you start off here in verse 1, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. These are the religious leaders of Ezekiel's day, who, by the way, sound about as bad as the religious leaders of Jesus' day. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, prophesy to them. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. And it gets worse from there. Not only do they only take care of themselves, they are actively abusing the people, using and abusing them as religious leaders. They are using their positions of authority and respect to take advantage of their people. Does that sound contemporary at all? Are there any religious leaders or political leaders who do that today? This, this is an old problem. Now, it goes on and on. It, it's quite a description of the sort of ways that they're taking advantage of people. And then you come to verse 17. It says, as for my flock, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will judge between one sheep and another and between rams and goats. Is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture? Must you also trample the rest of your pasture with your feet? Is it not enough for you to drink clear water? Must you also muddy the rest with your feet? Must my flock feed on what you have trampled and drink what you have muddied with your feet? It goes on to talk about bully sheep and bully sheep who are butting the smaller sheep out of the way so they can't get food and, and water. And you say, wow, they learned well from their shepherds. The sheep were treating each other the same way the shepherds treated them. And this whole passage in Ezekiel 34 is about bad shepherds and bad sheep. And then, in the middle of this, in the middle of this whole thing comes verse 23 and 24. And notice the promise again. I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David. Now, how long had David been dead by now? <laughs> about 400 years. So we know that this is talking about this, this big guy, David, to come. The Messiah, David. The everlasting father. The prince of peace. That David. The Jesus David. I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. This really adds a new piece to the puzzle. God says, you want to know what David is going to do when he comes? He is going to clean up all the problems in the church. He's going to take care of those pastors and religious leaders who are only thinking about themselves. He's going to take care of the bullies in the church who are only thinking about themselves and elbowing everybody else out of the way. That's what Jesus is. Jesus is coming to deal with the problems among believers. Why did he ever do that when he showed up? And so we have these clues about who Jesus is, who the Messiah is, who he's going to be when he comes. But Ezekiel 34 was probably not one of the favorite passages for religious leaders to read. Because it, it doesn't, you know, you hold that mirror up and it doesn't flatter you. And so, these pictures of who the Messiah is to be were dropping the clues. They were hidden in plain sight. <laughs> and oftentimes, the reason we don't things, see things that are hidden in plain sight is because we don't like them. And we don't see what we don't like. <laughs> My brother has a little difficulty with one of his eyes when he was little. And so he had to wear a patch over his good eye, his kid, to exercise his bad eye. Marie, if I'm telling this story wrong, correct me later. <laughs> and there's a story in our family that's become this tradition where he did not like doing the exercises that he had to do to exercise that battle. 
And my grandmother was sitting with him on her lap and going through a picture book. And there was a particular picture and it had a dog and a cat in it. And he was to be using his bad eye to identify the things in the picture. And so grandma turns to this and she says, Danny, do you see the cat in the picture? And he said, yes, but I don't see the dog. <laughs> <laughs> We see what we want to see. And Ezekiel 34 was not a nice thing to look at for religious leaders or for people who are bullying others. And so they just didn't see that part of the side of work. And when Jesus came, it was no wonder that when he did that work, they'd say, You're not doing the work of the side. Well, yeah, I'm a good shepherd. At the same time, it's a matter of perception. When I read these promises, it seems to me. He's going to be the best everything. He's, he's going to be great. And that's not the way Jesus. Good point. It, it led you to expect kind of this superhero. And Jesus did not look like a superhero. He looked like a guy from Galilee who spoke with a funny accent and who had calluses on his hands. And people said, who are you? Very good point. We're about to move to one last prophecy and then into the New Testament. But any other comments? Thank you, Marlene. Anybody want to just any comments that are part of your mind? I mean, this is a really quick survey. There's some verse I can't remember, maybe in Isaiah, where it talks about Christ being something that's not. I know Isaiah 53 is more about the cross, but that he's not. His appearance is not. Yeah, it's, it is Isaiah 53. I thought you would be going there. It's not verse 2 or 3, where it says, He has no beauty that we should desire him. I got to tell you a quick funny story about that. That um, I have friends and um, you know, a lot of students, even, who work at summer camps. And at summer camps, they do all kinds of things to get the kids into. And one of the things they did is they put on this whole program on the life of Jesus. And they chose one of the college students to play the part of Jesus. And he happened to be a really good looking guy. And so, after the play, he got a note from a parent who'd been there for this play. And you always are a little bit worried when you get a note after something like that. Oh boy, here's come criticism. So, she opens up and turned off and said, I really enjoyed the play, except it, it did not follow the Bible. Think about your actor who played Jesus and look at Isaiah 53 too. <laughs> so she looks it up. I'm surprised the play even messing with her because it's like, you know, he's not handsome. There's not even need to look at and desire him. And it was probably not her son who played the part of Jesus, I'm guessing. <laughs> but uh, she was commenting that it is true. Jesus was a very ordinary person. I don't know that he was ugly, but he was probably very ordinary looking. Yeah, good point. There was nothing to say, whoa. No. And yet the impact of his life was something that absolutely made people stand up and say, I cannot believe this. Now, I, I said one more, there's actually two more. Look at two real quickly here. Look at the book of Daniel, chapter nine. Daniel nine. And you've got to, oh, this this is something you've got to read on your own later. But the, the, the book of Daniel is at the very end of the 70 years of captivity. And in Daniel 9, Daniel is reading the book of Jeremiah, verses 1, 2, 3, 4. And he said, oh, wow. Maybe it was the first time he had really connected with it. He said, we're almost at the end of these 70 years. And he's reading there about the 70-year prophecy in, Dan in Jeremiah 29. And he says, we're almost at the end of that. And he says, and you, you, you can almost read this between the lines, he says, but we're no better off than we were then. I wonder if God is actually going to end the seven years of captivity. So it goes into this beautiful long prayer in which he says, God, please do what you said you were going to do at the end of these seven years and bring us back, take us back home. It's a beautiful story. While he's still praying, the angel Gabriel comes to him and he says, I've got news for you. This story is bigger than you think. This is not just about the end of these 70 years. This is not just about you going back home. This is about what I'm doing in the big picture to deal with sin and where the Messiah is going to fit into that. And Daniel 9, and look here at verse 20. While I was still speaking and praying, confessing my sin, 
and the sin of my people Israel, and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill. Holy hill would be the temple of Jerusalem. The man I had seen in the earlier vision, Gabriel, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. Now, I'm going to pause right there because the rest of this gets into a lot of algebraic formulas. And if you're familiar with them, you'll nod and say, oh, yeah, I, I, I've got this all charted out. We're not going to go there right now. But essentially what he does, you can read this later on your own, as he says, let me tell you exactly the time when the Messiah is going to be born. This was big news. He says, it's going to start here, and it's going to be this many years to here, and that's when the Messiah is going to show up. That's exciting. That's really exciting. And he gives them that information. So now, as we get closer to Jesus coming, the dots are starting to fill in, and God is giving them more information. From the book of Micah, just a few more pages short, Micah chapter 5. This is the last one. That's not okay. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. Here, writing after the time of Daniel, not only do we get the time, but now we get the location. I want you to just think about this. If we have the time and the location, couldn't there have been a welcoming party there? Yeah. Just let this sink in for a second. We may or may not have time to read this. John chapter 1 says, Jesus came to his own and his own received him not. I don't know if any of you have ever traveled and told everybody when you're coming home and you're expecting some sort of a welcome. <laughs> and maybe you've been gone for weeks or months and you get home and one person's at the barber, another person's buying milk, another person's out doing something with a neighbor and you say, what am I, chocolate? liver? Why didn't anybody even stick around to say, oh, glad you're back? Jesus came to his own family, who had had all these clues for centuries. And they knew the location, and they knew the time, and there was nobody there to welcome him. In fact, Joseph and Mary had a hard time getting a place at Motel 6. Because nobody had reserved a room for it. Look at Micah 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Africa, though you were small among, by the way, who was the famous guy born in Bethlehem before Jesus? David. David. Where else would David's David be born? But in Bethlehem. But you, Bethlehem, Africa, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be. Um, ba -ba -bum. Ruler. Oh, ruler whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Now you say, oh, that's a little bit oblique. They got it. And this is what's so crazy. They got it, but they didn't get it. Go to Matthew. Now we're in the New Testament. Go to Matthew. Chapter 2. <clears throat> now the chapter two. Verse one. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. Magi, Jews or non-Jews? Non-Jews from near or far. These are outsiders, the foreigners. They're not good guys, which is probably the main reason why the religious leaders are going to act like the fat cats in Ezekiel 34. And they're going to be the big bullies who bump them aside. But at the request of King Herod, we're going to give accurate information. Look at the story goes. But after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the kind of time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We have seen, we saw his star in the east, and we've come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. 
when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law. Now, these are the same guys, literally, if, particularly if they were fairly young, who would face off with Jesus in a few years. He called together all the chief priests and teachers of the law, and he asked them where Christ was to be born. And what did they say? No. They were right there. Where is he to be born? In Bethlehem, verse 5. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied. For this is what the prophet has written. And then they go from Micah 5. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, by no means are least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time of the star. And you know the rest of the story. And you say, wait a minute. <laughs> on the spot, they could come up with that answer, and they say, oh, yeah, Bethlehem, seven miles down the road. It's as close as Bethlehem is to Jerusalem. That, that's where we're going to be. <laughs> What's the disconnect here? Talk to me. What's the disconnect? They wanted Same. somebody, they wanted someone who would come in and oversaw the Romans and be a savage. <laughs> This didn't look like him in the summer. Did he really get excited about it? No excitement. Did they say, we, we've already got a contingent down there. We're on this. They did not even bother to go check it out. <laughs> they knew what the prophecy said. They yeah. didn't even ask the wise men to check it out. No. It's Herod who's doing that for nefarious purposes. Right. But yeah. they weren't... What else disconnect do you see here? They didn't realize the 70 years were up. Yeah, either that or they were in decent denial. Any others? Yeah. They were the filthy shepherds. Yep. And so they, yes, please. Why would God talk to some heathens? They were right there. Surely he would have told them. Exactly. What's wrong with me, God? Why are you talking to these magi people? They were content in the system. Yeah, they were content in the system, the status quo. Yeah, they, they didn't really want change unless it would benefit them. They yeah. don't want it to benefit everyone. Yeah, didn't really want God to benefit them, only to benefit, didn't want them to benefit the outsiders, only us insiders. I'll tell you, this is rich for us. Please. They were similar to many of the leaders in our world today. Where they were using the system to benefit themselves yep. instead of yep. serving the country that they were there to serve. Using the system to benefit themselves. Any other comments? Okay, our time is almost up. And, and I really do want us to be able to apply this to ourselves. It's easy to look and see other people who are making similar mistakes. You say, I, just, I know some church leaders who are just like these guys. I, I think I've seen that in so and so and so and so. But wait a minute. When am I acting like that? When do I prefer the status quo instead of being shaken up? When do I pursue, prefer something that flatters me instead of challenges me? When can I quote chapter and verse and, and religious talk? without it really making any difference in the way that I treat my kids. I mean, that, that's kind of getting down to the heart of this, isn't it? And so before we go into our study for next week, let's just sit with this for a second and say, these guys who could just casually say, oh yeah, I did Bethlehem. They knew the scriptures. They had studied all this stuff. And later, Jesus would say to them, it's one of the texts in your email, but I just quote it now. He could say to them, he said, you read the scriptures because you think in the scriptures you have eternal life. But they are they which tell of me, and you won't come to me for life. Kind of like a dog we had one time. I would point, and it would come sniff my finger. <laughs> <laughs> They're missing the whole point. They have their heads buried in the scripture and they can't see Jesus. And just knowing the Bible is not going to do anything for us. 
devil probably knows the Bible a lot better than all of us put together. But it's seeing Jesus in the Bible and being attracted and drawn to him. And if I'm not attracted and drawn to Jesus and say, Jesus, I really am one of you. Then what good is it to us? And so with Jesus hiding in plain sight this Christmas, what I'd like to encourage you to do is with every Christmas carol, with every musical piece that you hear, with any shows that you watch or cards that you get, you say, wait a minute, this is a reminder of something else. This is important. This is God coming to crush out evil at great cost to himself. Now appropriate for us to say, come, let us adore him. So come, How many, how many folks in the room? Sorry, I got a hearing aids and I want to hear it my cell phone. <laughs> how many folks in the room are associated with Southern Adventist <clears throat> University? <laughs> I'm always asking, or the board member, I'm always asking yeah. questions that I don't know if I should ask or not. But I'm not going to ask that question. I'm going to call the president of the university this week and ask him the question, and I'll tell you what the question is next week. Hopefully, we'll have the answer. That makes no sense to me at all. <laughs> but when Jesus was not hanged, he was crucified. And then I guess, what if we got a gallows? I want to ask you now. I'm going to ask you now. Is there a building at Southern Adventist University with a cross on it? There is. Is there a building at our university with a cross over? That was my question. Sometimes we're so smart. We have so much prophetic gift, possibly. I'm on the board. I'm not knocking everybody. Sometimes why we just know. So what's that possible? Is that possible? I'll probably be off the board next week. But that was my question. <laughs> this is really a special time. A wonderful time. I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday. We were walking as a pastor. A burning mail where he was here. We had lunch yesterday. He's the largest generation church got it in, in China. And he said, I love this time of year. And I thought he was talking about the weather. <laughs> you get so out of balance with the problem. I thought, sorry, I hate this time of year. It's cold. The wind is, my nose is running, my eyes are watering. So I'm not talking about the weather, Jim. I'm talking about Jesus. Oh, that. <laughs> anyway, Doug is going to teach again next week. And I taught the Christmas lesson a few years ago. He coached me. What you're going to learn next week is shocking. I know he's going to bring it all up. But Jim missed the point. So stay tuned. Don't leave us. Stay tuned.
Oh, you're doing so good. Come up here and have work. Oh, by the way, if you're not one of our email list, don't watch our lessons every week. Come and see me. And we get you on the list. I'll send the lesson to you. If you're on the list and you're not getting the lesson, then come see me. But we've got all kind of email problems floating around the chat. Room. Yeah. You can attach to it. Yep. Yep. We were resorting to carrier pigeons, but you didn't quite have to go there. <laughs> That's great. Oh, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for counting us valuable enough to sacrifice so much for us. This Christmas, may we adore you and find our joy in you. And it's in your name that we come. Amen. Thank you. See you next week.